We're coming up on the foundation upon which my entire life was built. We would sit around at the quick stop and we started noticing these ads for these midnight movies. In the car ride home, you could see this intensity in his eyes. This is what I've been waiting for my whole life. I want to do this. There is nobody in film school or any of that could, that could write like him. It's going to be on my tombstone. He's not even supposed to be here today. I'm not even supposed to be here today. Everyone got us. This to the news! They tapped into the subculture. When I saw Clerks, it felt like I belonged to this. I was immediately trying to set up the next thing. I got a phone call from the head of the studio. He goes, we're going to make $100 million. He was off by $98 million. We were in, and now we're not. Kevin has had a lot of ups and downs in his career, and a lot of resurrections. At a certain point, I gave up on Kevin Smith, filmmaker. Maybe it's because the critics were like, he's no filmmaker. I'm like, all right, they're right. But I got to a point where I'm like, I think I'm going to be so much more. The podcast, the stage shows, the hosting, making movies. Carved his own path. He was able to energize geek culture. Evan Smith is the man. He changed everything. It's me doing everything that I've never imagined I'd wind up doing. I do actually think like he got where he wanted to be. Now I just want to be Kevin Smith. I want to be the Kevin Smithiest Kevin Smith I could be from now until the end of time because that's all they'll remember about me when I'm gone. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cherry the Geek TV. I'm Joe Van Orney. Uh, Clerk is a fascinating uh, documentary uh, telling the oral history of Kevin Smith and his 25-year uh, film career from Clerks uh, to present day. Uh, Malcolm Ingram is the director and producer of Clerk, uh, which is coming out on a brand new Blu-ray special edition with loads of uh, bonus features on September 26th. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Clerk, the Blu-ray, and more. Malcolm, welcome to Cherry the Geek TV. What does it say about me the entire time you're talking? I was literally going, he, 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 he said oral. <laughs> I, I, was, I was making that joke inside my brain as well. I uh, was like, <laughs> ah, he said oral, that's funny. All right, moving on, I apologize. But you've been uh, friends with Kevin Smith uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, that's talk true. About Talk about that relationship. How did you guys meet? How did that met relationship the, develop over the years? Met at the Toronto Film Festival in uh, 1994. He was there with Clerk. And it's it's a funny story. I mean, he tells it a lot better. Um, but apparently when I, when I saw Clerk, I wasn't like... He asked me what my opinion of it was. We met, we, like, there was a dinner after the screening in Toronto that I was invited to by a friend of mine who was kind of a mutual friend. And Kevin asked me what I thought about the movie, and apparently, I, 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 like, I was just like, all right. I didn't, I didn't, he liked the fact that I didn't fawn over him. Um, so essentially, we've gotten, like, um, like, a one, like, I was working for a magazine called Film Threat and Kevin was in New Orleans for a film fest when we were there at the same time. So we just ended up hanging around like 94. We were just kind of, I was on the festival circuit uh, as a journalist and he was on it with Clark. So we just got running into each other. We, we liked each other's sense of humor. We just kind of got along really, really well. And then I got assigned to write a cover story for mall rats. Um, and on the set, we became very, very close. And then Miramax offered him a deal to finance two low-budget movies. And he offered one to me. So it was just kind of like this. So I'm a word hacked across the line. And so, uh, I, took, I took the money and ran. So as that relationship developed over the years, uh, did is that what and your friendship, is that what made you the perfect guy to direct this documentary about him? Because I'm sure he's been approached before by others to make films about him, and he's usually says no. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it just kind of like, it was, the 25th anniversary was coming up, Clerk, and I was just kind of like, uh, he'd been approached to write a book, 
I, I he he approached somebody to write a book, and I was there. They asked me to write a book initially. It was kind of like looking at this twenty-five year uh, history, and I'm I'm a documentarian, so it was just kind of just made sense. I was like, no, I'd rather make a documentary, and I just thought that it was good to kind of capture this twenty-five year period where, and I had seen so much happen. It wasn't so much. It was just I saw the tale unfold as it was unfolding. So I kind of, um, I just knew that I, I knew the story to tell. Like there's many ways you could tell Kevin's story. I just knew, I knew the way I wanted to tell it. And it just kind of worked. Um, that kind of, kind of, um, like I got most of the people I wanted to talk to. There wasn't, there was no glaring kind of person that wasn't covered. And we got to cover some interesting voices. Like it was really important that Mojer was a, was a big voice in it because Mojer is such a big part of the early uh, part of Kevin's career. So any chance to get Mojer on screen, I'm all for. So Kevin Smith's life as a fan, I'm, I've been a 25 year fan his life's been pretty out there, right? Public. Uh, if, if those that are fans that uh, listen to his commentaries on the DVD or go see his, you know, one of his live shows or, or listen to him at San Diego Comic-Con, for example. Uh, be, when I heard the concept of, of your documentary, I'm, I was like, well, I kind of know this stories already. I've heard these stories over the year. What was the challenge because then I think there's a lot of fans out there like me that probably felt feel the same way. What was the challenge? How did you go about uh, saying I'm going to tell this story in a fresh way? So even the, the the longtime fans, it'll it'll be entertaining for new people coming in, but it, but it'll also uh, be new and fresh for for the longtime fans. Well, therein lies a big challenge, and the thing about it is is that. Um, it's always best to get the people who get the people to tell their own story. And essentially the only way I was going to win with it was just telling a reliable oral history, not, not be afraid of like one thing that I didn't get into was the Jason Mewes drug thing, because that is something that like, you know, I could have taken 10 minutes to talk about that, but that, that is something that like is so covered. So, I mean, I tried, like, I skimmed over things. Like, there's certain incidents that maybe, like, the documentary is full. We kind of try and tell the whole story. But it is no, like, I could have easily done, like, for each year, I could have done, like, an eight-hour documentary. Like, there, like the, there is so much going on. There's so much that guy's been a part of. So much is connected to there's so many players in that story. There's so many different voices. And it's just kind of like I had to recognize right away that whatever I did was going to be condensed. And I had to tell the perfect, ver perfect condensed version of, uh, of this man's life. And basically, um, knowing Kevin, I knew that like family was a big part of it. And like you don't always like, you know, you don't always see. Or hear from his mother or his brother, um, his wife and his daughter and those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, and like getting Walt and Brian, like, you know, who like, you know, have their own podcasts and stuff. But usually they're kind of together, like having Walt and Brian, like talk about Kevin. Like that's a viewpoint you don't always get. Right. Um, so it's just it was just important to get the main players and had just have them reliably tell the story as it happened. Um, yeah, and that was it. I mean, like, there's, look, there's some people who are just like, look, I know this fucking story, and this is, um, you know, and I don't need to see this. And I understand that completely. Um, well, I'm going to tell you, as a fan, I, I watched the film last night. I give it an A+. plus. I, I was raving about this all night. I, I uh, went, my wife was asleep. I went, Woke her up after I, I finished watching. I was like, "You got to watch this documentary." Oh yeah, that's horrible. It's, uh, 
<laughs> well, she went back to bed. Uh, uh, a plus, like I, I, and I wanted to watch it again. I want to watch it with my seventeen-year-old uh, son, who just recently became a fan of uh, uh, Kevin Smith. Um, and and I don't have time. I don't have time to rewatch movies, right? But uh, this is one I, I wanted to jump in. I want to rewatch it again. So you succeeded uh, in in what you did and and telling That's... the story in a fresh way and and making it. Uh, uh, so enjoyable for a long time fan. The highest compliment that I get from this movie ever is when people say it makes them want to see a Kevin Smith movie. Like that's kind of like, you know, cause I mean, he's, he's had a really remarkable career and it's just kind of like the thing about Kevin is that he's so like, like he's a very fascinating character. He's been part of so much and like, I haven't been in the room in so much and seeing him part of so much. It's kind of like there's this all like there's tons of stuff that I left out, but it's just like you only have so much time. You have to like literally like like Ralph Garman, like, you know, isn't isn't in the movie. And it's like Ralph Garman is a huge part of Kevin's life. Like they have a podcast together. Um, Hollywood Babylon is a huge part influence on Kevin's um, move into podcasting. Um, and the fact that like he wasn't like that we couldn't find a way to weave him like documentaries you don't stitch them together you weave them everything has to kind of weave into everything and you know I find it a failure of me as a filmmaker that I didn't get Ralph Garman in the, in the actual movie but that's the great thing about doing a Blu-ray is that you you know we have the full interview there and available for people to see. Talk about assembling. Uh, you, you've kind of hit on some of the people that you've assembled uh, in the film. You've got the usual suspects that we expect to hear from Jason Mewes, Scott Mosier. Uh, you've got Kevin's family uh, that you mentioned. But, but you also have people like uh, Richard Linklater and uh, Penn Jillette, uh, Judd Nelson. And, um, t- talk about assembling these people. Was everybody kind of game when you approached them and said, hey, we're making this documentary? Uh, you got Ben yeah. Affleck, Affleck and Matt Damon. Uh, Stan Lee, uh, kind of just talk about assembling that group and and. Every, I mean, every, everybody was everybody was game. I mean, it was um, like Penn Jillette. Like, I mean, I I idolized Penn Jillette since I was a kid. Like, uh, Penn and Telly got killed. Like, was my first. Like that movie had such an impact on me. And um, but like Kevin and. Uh, Kevin and Penn have kind of a this weird thing in their lives where like Kevin was a huge fan of Penn until he got killed. Kevin's very influenced by like, you know, the fact that Kevin stays silent is very much partially influenced by Teller. Like it's all it's 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 kind of all there. So um getting an opportunity to talk to somebody like Penn Gillette, and I got to go back to their dressing room which is apparently legendary and stuff and Penn Jillette is one of the smartest people I've ever talked to in my life um, but like we just asked um, like essentially we asked like, I, for Richard Linklater I, I wrote him a letter and I said look this is why I want you to do it this is why you're an important part of the story and um, he was wonderful like I mean but what are like you know Richard like, like having like it says something about how special that Kevin is that you would have somebody like Richard Linklater and and uh, Penn Jillette and these incredible people talk about like and uh, Jason Reitman like Jason Reitman is talking about how Kevin's one of his favorite directors when like his father directed <laughs> Ghostbusters. Right. It's so it's so insane. Uh, Kevin has a tendency. How how, how should we put this? He's a little verbose, right? You ask him a question uh, at, at his shows, and sometimes his answers are forty-five minutes long for one question. Uh, as a filmmaker, is, is he like that with you? Like when you're when you're asking him questions for the film? Hundred uh, percent. Yeah. And uh, what's the how do you go about uh, condensing his answers and getting him? Because when you're watching, you don't. Stuff, I mean, that's what editing's all about. Like literally, you don't. Like you let him. Like look. Like, I mean, I know Kevin well enough that, like, it's not... Kevin's going to tell the story that Kevin wants to tell. You Like, you know, we just had to film him a lot. And we just had to, like, I knew the stories I wanted to tell. And um, you just got to sit around and kind of, you know... I mean, 
I had marathon conversations with him. Like we had long interviews. Um, Cause essentially, yeah, Kevin will, but he's such a great storyteller. You don't want to stop him from telling a story, you know, you, you know, and you know, you can use it, but we have like hours and hours of great footage of Kevin like you know telling his stories like it's what he does he's he's an incredible rock and tour he's um and it really like the funny thing is is i was a little i was a little naive like getting back to the question you asked before it's like i should have been a lot more terrified uh trying to put this movie together with the amount that guy puts out there on his own like competing like you know because in a sense you're competing with kevin himself because Kevin does such a great job of telling his own stories. So I think I was naive as a filmmaker to not be more daunted by that. Talk about your uh, the editing process. You, the, the film's masterfully edited. Uh, it, it, you said that a uh, good documentary uh, isn't stitched together. It, it weaves the story, and this is exactly what it does. Talk about your editor, uh, that relationship. Uh, uh, I have an editor, Sean Stanley. He started, I met him, he was editing my podcast. Um, so he was a podcast, like, he edited my podcast, and then he, like, I was making this documentary content, but I was like, want to try doing a movie? And he was like, yeah. So, like, we, we have a really great relationship. He's got, it, you know what? He's got great taste. Uh, we built a friendship, like, we're both nerds. Like, we both, like, you know, we, we love the same filmmakers. Like, you know, we love, you know, the 70s. We love Quentin. We love, like, um, yeah, like, we, we just share the same taste. We share the same taste. And, and because of that, our, like, our relationship, like, I send him a lot of, I don't sit with him in the editing suite and kind of say, okay, do this, this, and this. Like I do an interview and then we have a, we have a conversation about it. And I say, well, this is the parts we want to focus on. Da, 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 da. But he is very much uh, on his own to kind of making a lot of choices. And he always makes the right one. He's an incredible. Um, yeah. He's, a, he's, and hopefully he becomes a, you know, I think he'll make the jump to, uh, a filmmaker at some point i hope he does but he's very oh well, we, we co-directed a uh, phantom winnipeg together um so hopefully he kind of goes a brilliant creative guy but his name is sean stan what do you think it is about kevin smith that makes him such an endearing person and uh to so many people what what what, what, are, what is that quality that he has well kevin was kevin was really the first of a lot and essentially, like, right now, we're a generation of um, nostalgists. Nostalgia is the currency of nostalgia. And Kevin was really one of the first guy. Like, he was really, like, Kevin was nostalgic about the 90s in the 90s. You know what I mean? Like, he's such. And then, like, you know, Star Wars. Like people, Like, people weren't talking about Star Wars. You know, and all of a sudden there was this movie where like people are talking about Star Wars, like Marvel, like Stan Lee. Kevin had Stan Lee in his movie in the 90s. Like it was just kind of Kevin's been there, like, you know, his message for like being in contact with his fans, like podcasting. Like you see, he just did a podcast with Burt Kreischer. And it's so funny because... The model of part podcasting is basically built around a model that Kevin created, but like Kevin wasn't in it. Like you know, these like Bert Kreischer is making millions and millions and millions of dollars, um, rightfully so. I mean, like he figured, he, you know, he figured it out. But like Kevin, Kevin's like Kevin never did it to make millions. He just thought it was fun. He liked doing it. He liked doing stuff with his friends. So he kind of helped create this kind of podcasting world. And then co comedians came over and just are making so much money from it. So it's interesting that Kevin is kind of like, he's this kind of Zalig esque kind of character or Gump esque character that's just been like parts of things that like, and it's so many things that he's like, uh, He's a real connection to the kind of the pop zeitgeist. 
And it's just incredible how much he has been connected to. Like I just said, I sent him a text. Uh, I was talking to him on text today, and we're 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 planning on meeting up. And I'm like, what do you, you know? I'm like, what's your week like next week? And he's like, well, I'm getting an award from a town on Monday, and then we're selling all my art on auction on Tuesday. I'm just like, oh my god! Like this guy's life. It's 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 funny. Like it's just kind of like. And uh, I mean, the wonderful thing about Kevin is that he loves it. Like he doesn't, he's not jaded at all. And he loves, he's so, like me and Kevin got in a big fight making this movie, of course. Like, a, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to see a fight develop, have a friend make a documentary of another friend. Like there is, you know, there, there was fight. We didn't talk for a year. And there was a point where I was like, fuck it. Like, you know, whatever. I'm not going to, like, we got back. Um, and, uh, one thing that made me want to release the movie was we, we started talking again and I went on a, on a tour date where he was doing meet and greets and just seeing people's reactions when they basically like, you know, he's kind of behind a curtain, people come around. It's just like, like he means a lot to so many people and he's very genuine, like, and he recognizes that he takes none of it for granted. And he's he's genuinely thrilled to like it's not like he's not going through routine. He sincerely is very appreciative of the fact that people love his work, and like he's very happy to find people who like talking about him as much as he does. Uh, he indirectly is responsible for for me and and what we're doing here. This Cherry the Geek TV. I. I go every year to San Diego Comic Con. I'd sit in his uh in, in his uh panel, his show. Uh and and I remember one year somebody uh asked him for advice and he said, Hey, if you you know just I just started this podcast, my podcast, I just did it. I didn't maybe you know I probably the first one was probably really awful. The second one was probably really awful, but I got better at it. And and if you have a dream if you it just create something, go out and do it. Uh, and it might not be good at first, but you'll get better at it. And, and when the pandemic hit, I was always like a print, print journalism guy. Right. And the pandemic hit, everything kind of switched to zoom and zoom interviews and things like that started. And, and that was never anything I ever thought about doing, but that little Kevin Smith angel sitting there on my, on my shoulder. And I, I remember those words like, Hey, just you sure wouldn't look more like a devil. The devil was over there saying oral. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Good pull. Yeah. Um, let's talk about this Blu-ray. Blu-ray is coming out uh, September 26th. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the things, the, the film's been out to stream on, uh, and is still available to stream on video yes. on demand, but, but I'm a physical media guy. I love the thing I love about uh, discs, physical media, is that you get loads of uh, bonus features, bonus content. Tell people what they we, can expect. We uh, have the good bonus we did a, it's so funny. I did a commentary with Kevin where we don't talk about the movie at all. Like, it's really, uh, I went to New Jersey. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. And I went out to New Jersey um, to record the podcast with him. And like, we just ended up just talking. And it's really, it's, it's, it's a, it, it's, it's a very, it's a great conversation. It's very interesting. And he, he talks about some stuff he hasn't talked to me before, but it's really, really like that was our commentary. And I love that Kevin was just that free and loose. He's like, no, no, let's like, we'll do it. We'll do the commentary for as long as the movie is, but we'll just talk. I was like, that's amazing. And then, you know, we have the editor, Sean Stanley, that did a, did a commentary with his brother and he's the one who designed one of the posters and, He's very much they're you know they're very much been in uh, Kevin's world. Like I found them at, at a at a I, I met those guys at a hockey tournament that Kevin does in uh, Brantford, uh, Ontario, Canada. Like it's just you know Kevin Kevin does a hockey tournament. There's a lot of funny things there. Anyway, other things we have like we have an interview as I said before with. Um, uh, we we have Stan Lee's last interview. It's in, in its entirety, um, which was like 
getting that interview was like insane. Um, Cause I didn't know that was a really weird thing. Like for, for interviewing Stan Lee, it's just like people knew he wasn't well. He didn't know how unwell he was. And it was like, well, what do you do? Do you not ask or do you like leave it up to him if he wants to do the interview? Or not? So literally we just put out a request and we're like, look, Stan has, if Stan wants to, you know, we're making this documentary. Stan would like to, you know, talk about it. And if not, totally understand. Like we didn't want to. And he said, absolutely. So we went and it's just like, I wanted to, uh, I think I'm the only man who's ran into Stan Lee in the past 20 years that didn't ask for an autograph. Like I was just so focused. I didn't do the pictures. I didn't do the autographs. I was just like, this man has a, a limited amount of time and he wants to say what he wants to say. And I'm going to like get out of his way. And what he said, he sat down and I think I asked two questions, but he was so wonderful and generous and real and, you know, about his experience with Kevin. Uh, and it was, it was so wonderful to kind of experience that. So we actually put the whole interview um, on, on uh, the uh, Blu-ray. We also got uh, Ralph Garman, who uh, I was talking about before, who like we couldn't use before because we couldn't weave him in to the story. Um, so it's, yeah, so we have, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. It's like, it's got the juicy Blu-ray. We have an alternative ending that we actually shot like before, um, like we, we had a completely different ending in the movie um, that we actually, we, we included in there. So there's some good stuff. Juicy, physical media blu-ray bits and exactly. well i can't wait to see that blu-ray it comes out september 26th uh the film is called clerk this is malcolm Ingram. malcolm thank you so much for chatting with us. thank you brother thank you very much man it was good to talk to you <laughs>